turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Text beginning in verse 34, and this is Jesus. He's on the cross. Um, as we open up that part of the passage, here we go. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. The title of my sermon today is nearly as long as a passage we're considering, but it does express that what Luke was communicating. What, I think one could argue that many who pushed for Jesus' crucifixion knew exactly what they were doing. They knew they had no case against him. They knew he was innocent of all charges, but that didn't matter. They believed he needed to die. He was a threat to their very way of life. In some ways, it was like what Caiaphas said before them, when, and they, they reasoned, it's better for us that one man should die for the people, not that the whole world or the whole nation should perish. Many knew who Jesus claimed to be, but they refused to believe his claims. He must be put to death. So they crucified him. I commented last week on how brief that is in the scriptures, this this monumental event that happened that was planned before the foundation of the world happens and it's captured in a handful of words. They crucified him. As Jesus hung on the cross in agony, he spoke. He made a number of brief statements. We often talk about the seven last words of Jesus. This was actually the first of those where he uttered, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Those who read the account or read the account of the crucifixion might assume that those who were responsible for putting Jesus to death surely couldn't possibly have been forgiven for that. Yet we read here that Jesus on the cross presumably interceded for those responsible for killing him. I don't think it's possible for us to understand the cross until we understand who was on the cross, and that's what Luke wants us to comprehend. The words in the mouths of those who are actually mocking Jesus point us in the direction to that truth. Luke identifies for us several different groups of people who were present at the cross. There were soldiers who gambled for Jesus' clothing, who also mocked him, offered him sour wine, and then mocked him some more with words like, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There were people standing around just kind of watching what was going on. The Jewish rulers were also present, as they almost always were wherever Jesus was. Of all the people, you would think that these rulers, many of them scholars, many of them very... Uh, very much aware and knowledgeable about the Old Testament texts and prophecies. These who were present, they, their charge was, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. So they're mocking him for Jesus to save himself on the cross. Pilate also had something to say by way of the placard that was on the cross that was intended to identify Jesus' crime. This is the king of the Jews. Now I think for Pilate that was probably much more of a shot to the religious leaders than specifically aimed at Jesus. However, it was in a way a cheap shot at Jesus as well. So in view of all the mockery and the ignorance and the arrogance, what are we to make of that intercession? What did Jesus really mean when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? What was the extent of that forgiveness, or what was that prayer really directed? Um, what, did that, what was that intended to say? So let's start with just looking at the people that were gathered there who heard him say this. Let's start with the people who were watching. They had no idea what they were seeing. 
why they came is maybe a little bit of a mystery. Some people just desired to see justice served on the guilty, and so they came to crucifixions. I can't imagine spending um, that being an event that I would want to attend, but many people just came to see that. Some desired the gore. I, I, I don't get that either, but, but there, was all, there are always some who are attracted to such things. Some desired to have their curiosity satisfied. Who was being crucified this week? There, there have always been curiosity seekers. The people who came to watch probably came for, maybe came for these or perhaps other reasons. But what did they think they were seeing? I think what they thought they were seeing, that, was it that Jesus was a zealot getting what he deserved? Was Jesus' crucifixion uh, abuse? Or was it justice being applied by the Roman penal system? It, it could have been a teaching moment this is what happens to people who break Roman law. The charge, as we shall see, was often placed on the cross to say, in effect, if you commit this kind of crime, this is the price you will pay. So whatever else they thought they were seeing, they believed Jesus was some sort of a criminal who was getting what he deserved. So the question would be then, in regard to what Jesus said, was Jesus asking the Father to forgive these people? Whatever their motives for coming, the bystanders had no idea what they were seeing. They did not perceive Jesus to be the Son of God, who was dying for their sins as a substitute. That would have been far from their mind. And they, they have seen Jesus as innocent, wrongly accused. They may have seen him that way sentenced to death, but clearly they did not see Jesus as the one who was receiving in his own body the, the wrath of the Father poured out against sin, but poured out on him. Clearly this is not a blanket declaration of pardon in relation to salvation for all who were present. And though the request for forgiveness was connected to the ignorance of the people, not knowing what they were doing was not uh, was not then, nor is it now, a free pass for judgment. So what did Jesus mean when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? One might reason that anyone who was a, attached to putting the Son of God to death surely had committed a sin that could never be forgiven, ever. But this prayer seemed to suggest otherwise. All right, before we answer, let's move on. The soldiers and the rulers were mocking. They had no idea what they were saying or doing in relation to Jesus. Let's start with the, with the garment gamble. Um, the revelation, actually, of dividing the garments between the soldiers who were guarding him and casting lots for that seamless piece of clothing rather than cutting it into pieces, all of that preceded Jesus' intercessory prayer. Dividing the garments among themselves is what soldiers did. It was sort of a bonus, kind of a supplement to their wages. Whatever they could get, they took advantage of it. But it was far more than that. In fact, the psalmist, you know this, the psalmist in, in Psalm 22, it's a messianic psalm written by David, he writes, they stare and gloat over me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. When would that have been David's experience? Instead, it's a prophetic word. David writing it probably really didn't know what he was writing even. But certainly that is what happened to Jesus. The soldiers were doing what they do. They had no idea that they were fulfilling prophecy, that they were fulfilling scripture concerning the Messiah. What about the mocking challenges? Well, both the soldiers and the rulers of the people, these religious rulers, ridiculed Jesus. The ruler said, he saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one, the soldiers added, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. The religious rulers reference to Jesus' saving ministry likely included the miracles he performed, many of which they had probably witnessed. 
When they're thinking save yourself, what are they thinking? They're thinking bringing himself off the cross, saving his life, his physical life. They had seen Jesus do various things. He saved sick people from disease. He delivered possessed people from demon oppression. He even saved, if you will, deceased people by bringing them back from the dead. So they're not really challenging Jesus' power to save, but they did charge him, if he can do that, let him save himself. Notice that though they echoed the acknowledgement that Jesus was the, was the one given by God to redeem God's people, they misunderstood redemption as physical in relation probably to Rome and not spiritual in relation to sin. They were not ignorant of the claims about Jesus, but they had no clue he really was the Messiah, the chosen of God. The soldiers knew that the charge against Jesus was his claim to be the king of the Jews. Kings don't die on crosses. Kings order others to be put to death. So if you are really the king, they're saying, what are you doing on the cross? So they mocked him. So was Jesus, when he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, was he asking the Father to forgive the soldiers and the rulers of the Jews for their mocking and for the failing to understand what they were doing? The Old Testament prophet Isaiah had written about the Messiah's death. In Isaiah 53, verse 12, for example, we read, He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Luke puts him right in between the transgressors, in the middle of them. Not only the two thieves, but all the rest of the people there were transgressors. Isaiah continued, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. David wrote prophetically, again in Psalm 22, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count my bones, all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clo clothing they cast lots. Whatever the soldiers and the rulers of the people knew or should have known, they didn't see this man as the fulfillment of these prophecies. They failed to see this prayer of Jesus as the beginning of the fulfillment of the, of the promise of intercession by Jesus to the Father on behalf of many. So were the soldiers and or the religious leaders forgiven that day of the crime of putting the Son of God to death? I would say no. Were these forgiven for not knowing what they were doing? Not exactly. Some would be forgiven, but not all, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But let's move on to the last one, and that would be Pilate, when he put the sign about Jesus, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews, he was ridiculing, but he had no idea what he'd written. Now, let's, let's think about what Pilate thought he had written. See, the charge the Jews had brought to, uh, to Pilate with the hope of convicting Jesus was tied to Jesus' claim with being the promised Messiah a claim to which the Romans, frankly, could care less. So what if he's a Messiah? Why is that a big deal to the Romans? Well, in order to gain some traction with the Romans, the Jews tweaked the charge from Messiah to king to charge Jesus as claiming to be the king of the Jews might get Pilate's attention as a threat to either his rule or maybe even to Caesar's reign. So by, uh, but in examining Jesus, it was clear by Jesus' own testimony that he was no threat to Pilate and no threat to Caesar. Nevertheless, Pilate succumbs to the demands of the people and he orders Jesus to be crucified. Instead of writing a legitimate charge, Pilate takes a shot at the Jewish leaders by writing, King of the Jews. Now, he knew that that would irritate the leaders. That's why he did it. But he also, and, and when they asked him to change it, he refused to do so. In effect, he was saying, this is Jesus, king of the Jews, this is your king. 
You see the slam that he made on them. So that's what Pilate thought he was writing. But what was Pilate actually writing? Pilate had written the truth. Jesus not only was the king of the Jews, but he was the king of all kings. As the king, he was providing his salvation to all who would embrace him as the king, as their king. Surely we've discovered by now that though people freely act on their own volition, everything they do is ultimately directed by a sovereign God who flawlessly accomplishes his purposes, including the death of his own son, to gain the salvation of all he is determined to save. Even a pagan ruler had written the truth about the crucified king. So back to our original question. Was Jesus asking the Father to forgive Pilate for ordering him to be crucified? Pilate and all the rest involved here. Was he saying that? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And again, I would say not exactly. As was mentioned a couple of weeks ago, even though Pilate declared Jesus to be without guilt, he nevertheless allowed Jesus to be crucified. Remember? I find no fault in this man. But go ahead and crucify him. A few years following Jesus' death, Pilate actually committed suicide. He, he never knew the forgiveness of which Jesus spoke. In the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, listen to what he said. Yet among the mature, we do, not, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, read that again, none of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. As it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Now there's a whole lot more in that text than we have time to consider, but essentially Paul is reminding us that on our own, we will never figure out the gospel. We won't on our own come to faith in Jesus Christ as the Lord of glory. But the Father has prepared, and the Son has paid for and provided, and the Holy Spirit has delivered us to us the gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, the righteousness of Christ, that we might know the wisdom of his glorious grace in the gospel. We don't get that on our own. We can't. We don't get our sin. Uh, we don't get our sin. We don't get his sacrifice. We don't understand that. But he is able to open our eyes and our hearts to believe. And when he does, we can know the joy of forgiveness and we can know the blessedness of life eternal. That which God has prepared for those who love him in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is not heaven, by the way. Lots of people look at that and they say, well, there, there it is. There's, there's, the, there's the statement of heaven. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Well, it's true that heaven's going to be great, but that's not what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He was talking about God's salvation, his forgiveness, a new life in Christ Jesus before we ever get to heaven. The people, the soldiers, the Jewish rulers, and Pilate, none of them knew what they, were do, what they were seeing or doing or writing in regard to Jesus. But if we have been saved by him, we do know. Some believe that Jesus' prayer was answered in the 40-year delay of the destruction of Jerusalem. You know your history. Um, Jesus, around 30 AD, was crucified. 70 AD, uh, General Titus came in uh, to the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, destroyed the city, um, wiped it out. So some people think that Jesus' prayer was a delay in the destruction that was coming. Some believe the answer to Jesus' prayer is found in the thousands who came 
to faith in Christ a few months after his death, beginning essentially at Pentecost. Some see the answer to Jesus' prayer as a delay in the immediate judgment that, um, that of God on the whole of humanity for putting the Son of God to death. All of those are possible. What Jesus prayed was a, rem was a reminder to us that it was only through his death that forgiveness could be granted. And it would only be granted to those whom he drew to himself to trust him, to trust in him alone for our salvation. One writer said it this way, certainly any mortal man would have desired only to curse or revile his killers under these circumstances. One might even think that God incarnate would wish to call down some thunderous blast of judgment against such wicked men. But Christ was on a mission of mercy. He was dying to purchase forgiveness for sins. And even at the very height of his agony, compassion filled his heart. The phrase for for they do not know what they're doing does not suggest that they were unaware that they were sinning. Ignorance does not absolve anyone from sin. These people were behaving wickedly and they knew it. Most were fully aware of the fact of their wrongdoing. Pilate himself had testified of Jesus' innocence. The Sanhedrin was fully aware that no legitimate charges could be brought against him. The soldiers in the crowd could easily see that a great injustice had, was being done. And yet they all gleefully participated. Many of the taunting spectators at Calvary had heard Jesus teach and seen him do miracles. They could not have really believed in their hearts that he deserved to die this way. But they were ignorant of the enormity of their crime. They were blinded to the full reality that they were crucifying God's son. They were spiritually insensitive because they loved darkness rather than light. Therefore, they did not recognize that the one they were putting to death was the light of the world. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. End quote. So, was there any way that Jesus' prayer was specifically answered? One of the thieves on the cross next to Jesus was forgiven, wasn't he? A centurion, one of the soldiers who crucified Christ, may also have become a new creation in Christ Jesus. At Pentecost, thousands in Jerusalem who were converted to Christ, some of them may have been among the ones who demanded Jesus' death and who mocked him from the foot of the cross. Luke actually wrote this concerning the religious rulers of the day. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So Jesus' prayer of forgiveness did not guarantee the immediate and unconditional forgiveness of those who participated in the crucifixion. Jesus was interceding on behalf of all who would repent and turn to him as Lord and Savior. When the people responsible for his death finally realized the enormity of what they had done and sought the Heavenly Father's forgiveness for their sin, he would not hold the murder of his beloved son against him. The payment for sin had been made in full and the intercession of the son for forgiveness was granted. This was not only true for those that day at the cross, but that prayer continues to be made and answered on behalf of those who are drawn to him and given faith to believe in him. Some, some would make the case, and, and again, um, we talked about this a few weeks ago, but yeah, the, the Jewish rulers were responsible for Jesus' death. Pilate was responsible for Jesus' death. The Roman soldiers were responsible for Jesus' death. All those different ideas, and, and then we could make the case that, um, that we were responsible for Jesus' death, and, and all those things are true. We also noted that Peter makes the case that it was God who put his own son on the cross. So ultimately, that was in God's plan and purpose, and he's the one who brought that all about. But nevertheless, 
here we are in our sin, and we, we read in the scriptures, and this is a mystery to a certain extent, we read in the scriptures that Jesus intercedes for us. Read the book of Hebrews. He intercedes for us. He continually intercedes for us. Even on the cross, he's interceding for those, in effect, who would believe. When we sin, we sort of know what we're doing, but not really. We know we're sinning, but we don't realize the extent of that against a perfect, holy God. And then he opens our heart to believe, and when we believe and embrace the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ, we understand the answer to that precious prayer. Every week, we read a pardon here. We do it on purpose because we need to understand that though our sins deserve the judgment of an almighty God, and they deserve us to be separated from God for eternity. God in his grace, through what Jesus accomplished on the cross, and him drawing us to himself so that we might embrace the gospel, we have been washed. We have been cleansed. We have been made new creatures in Christ Jesus. Our sin has been covered by the righteousness of Christ. We have been made brand new. And every time we sin, and we do, I, we've, we talked about this before. First John, as John is writing, he's writing in black and white, he's writing very clearly, and he's saying things like, Christians don't sin. And when they do, they have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Because of what he did, we listen to that prayer, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He forgives us not because he writes it off for no reason. He forgives us because he paid for us with his blood on Calvary's cross. And we have been pardoned declared righteous, justified before him. Do you know that? Do you belong to him? Has he, has, has he opened your heart to believe the gospel? Has he drawn you to him that you might believe him and trust him and know his forgiveness? If that's true, then you can rejoice. What's the word hallelujah mean? It means praise the Lord, right? For he has paid it all. Let's pray. Father, uh, words cannot express our gratefulness to you for what you've accomplished in sending your son to die for us that we might have eternal salvation. We, many things in the Bible, we, we simply are overwhelmed by what they say. I'm sure we don't get it all right. We don't comprehend the, the fullness of what you're even saying in your word, though we want to and we study and we continue to desire to know what you mean. But this we know. We were sinners, we were lost, and we were dead. Jesus died. When we trusted him as Savior, we were cleansed, we were forgiven, we were made new creations, we became children of God through new birth, through adoption into your family, we became new creations in you. Don't ever let us forget what we have in Jesus. Help us to understand who you are and live for you for the glory of your name. Thank you for your word that tells us of these great truths. It's in your name we pray.